affection and just my soul's attention. Song that last a moment. I'll live a life of honest worship. If I'm here to sing, then I'll sing with purpose. All the praise, Lord, you deserve it. And I only wanna sing if I sing with everything. If I sing for you, my King. Whoa.
light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me there's no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down coming after me there's no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me there's no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down for the love of God. It just keeps coming after you, keeps coming after you. Thank you, Jesus. God, we just worship you in this place. We worship you in our home, in our car today, God, wherever we are. Father, you fill the space with your presence. Ooh, come on, just worship with everything you got today. Grave. 
you got there, but I want to tell you that there is grace for the season that you're in. There's grace for what you're walking through. Every trial, listen, the turmoil, there's grace. When you walk through these things that you think, I don't know how I will survive this time. When you come out the other side, you look back and you go, wow, the grace of God, the grace of God that was on me in that season and I thought I would not make it. But God's grace is in the middle of the fire. His grace, His mercy is in the middle of the fire. His love and His joy, come on y'all, His joy is in the middle of the fire. His peace is in the middle of the fire. Sometimes we say, I can't see God. I can't, I can't feel him. I don't know he's there. 
But when you start to feel peace and you start to feel joy in the middle of what you're walking through, that is God in the middle of that fire with you. That is God in the middle of that circumstance with you. So today when we sing those words, we're talking about all the good things of God that are in the middle of that situation. If we see them, if we recognize them, if we speak them, they're there. Keep saying it till you get it, till you know it. Say it till you know it, that God, you are there in the middle. Your grace is here, it's sufficient. God said his grace is sufficient for my needs, it's sufficient. That means there's enough for this season. And when this season is over, God will give you enough grace that will be sufficient for the next season. He's so good like that. So good like that. Woo. Even in the middle of COVID, God will grace you for this season, church. He graces us for the uncertainty. Mm. Thank you, God. We thank you, God, for your word. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your peace and your joy that's literally in the middle of us today. Father, we're so honored to worship you. God, I just pray for everyone that's walking through a situation that they don't know how they even found themselves in. They don't know how to get out of, but God, you are gracing them for this time and you know exactly the way they should walk. You know the doors that have to be open. And so God, we just pray today over every person that needs to hear that today, that God, you're working it all out. The crooked paths become straight. And so Father, we just thank you today for your word. God, your word are your promises to us. They are yes and they are amen. They are seed in our hearts. Come on, just say it. And they bear fruit in my life. They are seed in my heart and they bear fruit in my life. And so God, we just thank you for an awesome day together. It's gonna to be a great day, God. Great day. We thank you, God, for your presence that it floods our homes, floods this place. God, thank you. So grateful for you. And so God, we just declare right now that your word, your word, God's gonna give us wisdom and revelation and knowledge of you. In Jesus' name, everyone says amen. Amen, y'all. Come on, I'm going to turn this over to Pastor Andrew. Come on, brother. Woo! Woo! Hey, that's just worship this morning, right? That's awesome. Hey, my name is Andrew. I'm the youth pastor here at City Point Church. And if it's your first time with us, we're so excited that you've joined us today, whether it's in person or online. Um, if you could do us a favor, though, and text the word welcome to the number that's behind me or on the screen for those of you who are online. Our team members are just going to reach out to you, um, share a little bit about our family, as well as answer any questions that you guys might have. So thanks so much for joining us today. A uh, couple things that we want to cover before we continue the message. First up, today we're doing communion. For So all of you in the auditorium, you guys have seen the communion elements. But for you online, we encourage and invite you to join us in communion. So grab some crackers, some, some water, whatever you have in the pantry or fridge, and join us for communion at the end of service today. Um, we do uh, want to remind everybody in this room that our Souls for Souls uh, campaign that we're doing, the last Sunday that you can bring your donation is this next Sunday, August Sunday. August Sunday? August 9th. I'm so sorry. August 9th is the last day that we'll be collecting all of those shoes. And we just want to say, you know, thanks so much for jumping in with us. Your guys' generosity has already brought in a ton of shoes. We've, we've been collecting it as a staff throughout. It's been amazing. So continue your generosity. We still uh, want to, you know, collect as many shoes as we can, bless as many kids as we can. And I know the youth, we've got a goal that we're trying to hit by Wednesday as well. So we have to make sure we get that. Uh, up and running. So again, that's a new shoes, 13 toddler, up to seven in youth and sizes. And the last day we'll collect that is next Sunday. A um, couple new things that we're kicking back up. First up is Connection Point. It, it is actually going to be taking place August 30th. And you ask, what's Connection Point? 
it's literally a connection point to our church. You could come in, meet Pastor Eddie and Pastor Julie, sit down, hear the story of our church, you know, what our beliefs are, how to get involved. It's essentially our membership class, but uh, we're going to kick that back up on Sunday, August 30th. The class is from 5 to 8 p.m. Don't worry, we'll feed you at the end. You'll be all right. We'll take good care of you. But you can go and sign up and register at citypointchurch.com slash connection point, and we'll take care of you. And the last thing, all right, y'all got to do better than first service. Where are my married couples at? That's marginally better, marginally better. But, hey, we, we, we have got um, XO Conference. It wasn't canceled. It was delayed because of a little thing that's been going on. But we are resuming our XO Conference September 18th and 19th. So um, we're asking you guys to pre-register again for us at citypointchurch.com slash XO. We've got all that information in there. Uh, what we were going to do in the spring, same thing. We just want to make sure we do it in a safe manner. So that's all we've got for announcements today. Who's ready for the message? That's right. Hope you guys are ready online to hear Pastor Eddie's next message as we continue our series, Running with the Giants. Check it out. Church, for those who are here in the house with us this morning, for those who are online, welcome also. We're one church with multiple locations uh, nowadays, but we're glad everybody's here with us. And as Andrew said, if you're with us for the first time, we'd love to hear from you today by texting the number that'll be on the screen. Uh, we're trying to get things certain, applying things back into our church schedule. One of the things we're still working through is water baptism. I think we'll probably do that in September. I've got to build up the ability to baptize people again because a lot of this got messed up during the heart surgery. So I wouldn't want to take you down there and leave you there. So we're, we're working that out. And then we're trying to figure out how we do online people baptism, like fill up your tub, take, you know, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, baptize yourself. Just don't take your laptop because you'll see Jesus. Um, anyway, we're working on it. When we get an answer, we'll let you know. Uh, we're getting there. So what's happening uh, in the month of August is we have 21 days of prayer. And it's really just to a place for all of us to just go back and to reset our spirit, man. I know during this coronavirus, which I'm tired of the word even, uh, that, you know, it's changed a lot of things. But one of the things that shouldn't change is our spirituality and our and our pursuit of Christ. And so this is an opportunity for the next 21 days to kind of put the pedal on the gas a little bit harder. Uh, maybe, you know, prayer is not part of everything you do every day. Maybe set some phone timers to, to just stop and pray for 10 minutes a day like Daniel, you know, uh, morning, noon, and night. And, and we also have some devotions online that you can go through. But regardless, over the next 21 days, we're asking all of us uh, to pray. We're going to have an in-person prayer meeting here at the church, an online prayer meeting. Both of those are accessible to you, and we'd love for everybody just to take this time. You say, Eddie, I don't even know how to pray. Well, we have little prayer books we can give to you. But the easiest way to start is just say, good morning, Father, and talk to him about your day. And if you messed up, say, hey, I messed up yesterday. Help me to grow past that in my life. And this is what I need. And, and God, just have your way in me. And if you talk to your heavenly Father like a real person, prayer is a lot more fun than if you start going, my Lord, Savior, and King, I beseech thee, like, God's is like, okay, come talk English to me later. Like, it's just, so when you pray, talk to your Father. So today we're continuing a series called Running with the Giants. We're looking at their successes and some of their failures. Uh, today we're going to look at somebody who was a follower of Christ and really kind of on Jesus' point team, if you will, uh, of service. And there's no books written about her, um, you know, as far as in the Bible. She's not like a David who led a nation, was a mighty warrior. She's not like a, a Jonah that re brought revival to a city. She was just a quiet 
member of the team that went with Jesus and ministered. Her name was Mary Magdalene. And uh, history tells us that, you know, one of the things that's funny is I've often heard that Mary was a prostitute, but scripture actually doesn't say that, nor does any of the supporting documents. That came from a pope uh, about 1,500 years ago that was preparing for Easter and decided to add a little bit of spice on his Easter message and just made it up that she was a prostitute. And ever since then, people all over the world, even you know, now we'll say that she was, but there's no scriptural evidence of that. So I want to talk to you about some truths, you know, of it. I mean, I could say she works at Starbucks. Like that's about as real as it gets. So we're going to talk about some truths of Mary. And uh, what we know is also with other supporting documents that Mary, after the ascension of Christ, became a, a key member in the birth of the church and was a great leader. And so I want to start here with her encounter. And it says this in Luke 8, 1, that there were, uh, he continued according to the plan. And I love that, that Jesus had a ministry plan. He just didn't wake up every day and say, hey, let's just see what happens. He had a plan. He said, hey, guys, this is what we're doing. And they traveled from town after town, village after village, preaching God's kingdom, spreading the message, and the 12 were with them. But along with those 12, we see another list of names, verse 2. There were also women in their company who had been healed of various afflictions and illnesses. Mary, the one called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. Jesus set her free. And from the day she was set free, and she began to be a follower, right alongside the other 12 disciples. And so we see Mary as somebody who was not only dynamically changed by the ministry of Christ, but she also became a follower of, of him. And so I think all of us in our life could use some freedom. And Mary was on the front row seat of that freedom in her life. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today, and I thank you for the story of Mary. I thank you that it's included in all four Gospels because there's something for us to learn from her. And so, Father, we sit down today at the table with Mary, and, Father, we want to learn the lessons that she would teach us. Father, we thank you for your Holy Spirit that's here, that your presence guides and leads us. And, Father, I pray that you would bring your power to your word, that you would confirm it with working in our hearts and our lives, setting us free, healing our bodies. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, now, before she met Jesus, Scripture tells us that Mary was tormented somehow by these evil spirits and, and that now she had this freedom. And she used that freedom to basically become a follower of Christ. And she was bound. And we don't know necessarily what people saw with the bondage that she had with these evil spirits. Maybe it was spiritual. Maybe it was mental torture. But somehow she experienced it. I'm sure Mary kind of had a name for it. I'm sure everybody that knew Mary said, hey, well, Mary's just this. And most likely this spiritual uh, um, oppression looked more like toxic thoughts or spiritual influences. Maybe it looked like depression or fear. But something inside Mary where she, the, vo the influence of the enemy was in her life. And I, I would even say this, as long as we're talking about dark influences, that these influences choke the life out of us and they cripple us. I know that, and what I've got laid on my heart is that there's people that through this pandemic that have been going through, that this has opened up a door for fear in your life. And, and, there, and it's true, when you face a pandemic, you face a virus. I, I'm on a medication right now that lowers my immune system. I'll be on that medicine for the rest of my life so that my heart, so my body will accept this heart. I understand the precautions and the wisdom we need to live by right now because it's very real. But then beyond that, sometimes what the enemy loves to do is bring in a spirit of fear on top of that. And that fear begins to cripple not only one area of our life, but every area in our life. I mean, the truth is, is that we live in a world of risk. You can, we've had car accidents. They say that uh, 4.5 million Americans will be attacked by a dog this year. 50 of them will die. I mean, the last thing that person saw is like they see Jesus and they're like, wait, I just saw a chihuahua. What, what, what am I doing here right now, you know? There's a lot of reasons for us to be afraid in the world that we live in. But what God doesn't want us to do is allow that fear to guide us. He wants his spirit to guide us, and he wants wisdom to guide us and peace. And so maybe that's you today. Maybe you've had just an overwhelming sense of fear has crippled you as we've kind of gone through this experience as a nation and as a world. And what I'm here to tell you today is Christ wants to set you free. Not set you free so that you can be unwise and be reckless with your life, but free so you can live in the freedom that he's provided for you. And so for those that, that you say, yeah, that's me, whether you're in person or online, you say, man, I, I, it's like fear has just en encapsulated me. Then I have good news for you today is that Christ came to set you free from that, just like he did Mary. 
I think so many times in our life when we talk about dark spiritual influences, we dumb them down and we don't give credit to the enemy. We just say, well, that person's negative or that person's fearful or they just grew up that way. And, and all of a sudden we, we kind of justify the presence of this dark influence in our life. Rather than just say, hey, there is a real enemy behind this, that he is influencing me, that, that it's an infringement on my spiritual freedom that God has given me. In other words, he just wants us to call it something else to give him space. We almost make friends with it, and we become familiar with it. But whatever is torturing Mary, she, she, she probably had a name for it too. Like we name our problems, and we just kind of let them be. But Jesus walked in, and he says, listen, those spirits don't have any place in your life. And not only am I going to set you free from one, I'm going to set you free from all of them. And seven is a picture of completion in Scripture. He says, I'm going to make you completely free, Mary. Whatever is binding you, whatever is aggravating you, whatever sits on your shoulder and speaks into your ear all day long, I have come to set you free of it, and I don't want you to wrestle with it anymore. This is a spiritual problem, not a thinking problem. It's something that I'm going to cast out of your life. And if we truly set our hearts to believe and we ask God, then all of a sudden we understand that his freedom is what truly saves our life. And so if we were sitting down at the table with Mary, I think one of the things she would tell us is this. This is my first point, is freedom, freedom empowers us to follow Christ. Freedom. Because if we aren't free, then we're not going to follow. She didn't follow before she was set free, but after she was set free, she got a different master. Used to, she was mastered by these seven spirits, and now she chose her master, and her master would be Jesus. And I would say this, sometimes those who struggle with following, it also may mean that something else is leading you or something else is controlling you. If it's not leading you into things of Christ, then it's not Christ the one at the leadership. Romans puts it this way. You know well enough from your own experience that there are some acts of so-called freedom that destroy freedom. It's true, you can think however you want to think and live however you want to live, but at the same time, if your thinking and your lifestyle puts you in a spiritual prison, you're not really free, even though you chose to be in that prison. Offer yourselves a sin, for instance, and it'll be, you know, and it's the last free act. He goes on, but offer yourselves to the ways of God and the freedom never quits. I love that. Offer yourselves to the ways of God and your freedom never quits. All your lives, you've let sin tell you what to do. And notice the, the terms he uses there. He says it tells you what to do. It's a whisperer in your ear. It's talking to you all the time, saying how you should feel, how you should think, how you should be offended, how you should be hurt, how you should just do it yourself. It's telling you how to think. But verse 17, but thank God you started listening, listening to a new master, one whose commands set you free to live openly in his freedom. He says, not only will God set you free, he says, but he's going to be a voice in your life that leads you to freedom. And if you want to define what, it's, what God wants for us as followers of Christ, it's that we live truly free. Not just in a political system of freedom, because there's people who live in communism right now that are freer than some Americans. Are y'all here this morning? That freedom is something that takes place between your heart. It's something that God gives you. I've told you all the story. When I was a teenager, I struggled with suicidal thoughts and depression. And I went to church and somebody prayed for me. And, and they broke that power off of me and that spiritual influence off of me. And it wasn't like the movies. I didn't levitate or my head spin around. It was just they prayed for me and something was broken off of me. And I walked into that room, a depressed, suicidal young man. I walked out of that room free It with joy in my heart. And I can tell you right now, God's freedom is real. And some of us have been struggling with an enemy that we need God's power to deal with in our life today. And, it, and God's made it easy for us to deal with it through the gift of his son in our life. And so I want to tell you this morning that that voice in your life, if it's leading you away from the things that God has for you, it's not a voice of freedom. Because God's voice of freedom is going to lead you into a place of peace and of loving and of serving, of generosity and of gratitude towards him. In fact, Jesus put it this way in Luke John, in John 8. It says, so if the Son sets you free, he says, you are truly free. And my prayer for you, church, is that some of you, um, all of us, will live truly free. Where we don't live carrying down around an anchor in our life. It's not like we have a sail pushing us another direction, but we're able to set a path and say, God, I want to do what you've called me to do. So Mary did something with her new freedom. She didn't just say, oh, praise God, I'm saved. I'm going to go home and sit on my rear end for the rest of my life. She did something with it. She got up with that new freedom, and, and many of us have done the same thing. She became a follower. 
And not only did she become a follower of Christ, she took it one step further and said, I want to become a partner in your ministry, Jesus. And I would say if God has a dream that is universal for every believer and every follower of Christ, he wants you to become a partner in his ministry to reach the people of this planet. And that is God's dream for you to take everything you are, all your gifts and all your resources and all your talents, to get on board and to say simply, I want to serve your purpose with my life. And that's exactly what Mary did. In fact, it says in verse 3 that this group of women that she was with, they contributed from their own resources to support Jesus and his disciples. Why did Mary do this? I think she did this because her heart was grateful. And I'll tell you this, all generosity in our life comes from gratitude. If you're generous towards the ways of God and generous in your time and all the things that you have, it's because it comes from a place of gratitude. But I'll tell you this, gratitude is your choice. I've seen plenty of believers who receive something beautiful from God but then walk home and never turn around and show gratitude towards the ways of God in their life. They can receive something, but yet they live an ungrateful life and existence. Now, I can tell you this. If you choose to live a life of no gratitude towards God, it won't be a blessed life. Yeah, you may get money, but that money is not God's blessing in your life. The true gratitude, is what, when you want to see the signs of gratitude in our life, it grows our relationship with God. When gratitude is present in our life, it matures us in our faith. And there's no way to express gratitude towards God without that gratitude pulling you closer to him. In fact, he, God expects us to worship. And worship and gratitude towards God is an expression of your freedom because before he set you free, there was nothing in you that wanted to worship him. But now that you are free, there should be something that aches on the inside of you that says, I want to worship the one who set me free. The scripture tells a story of these 10 lepers that were all, uh, all had leprosy. I don't know much about it. I don't think, I think I had it once, but it, it went away with some cream. But I, I'm not really sure. But there's these 10 lepers in Scripture, and Jesus healed all 10 of them. And what Scripture goes on to say, that not only did he heal all 10 of them, but then he tells a story about the one that came back. Uh, this is Luke 17. So Jesus healed them, and then he was looking for them. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus shouting, praise God. He was just having his own little worship service, no band. Maybe he had his ear pods in. Couldn't know, he didn't know he was singing really loud. I've done that in the gym. Uh, just saying, praise God. Verse 16, he fell on the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he was done, what he had done. Imagine that. What a beautiful picture. This man was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, didn't I heal ten? Where are the other nine? What catches me in this story is that Jesus was looking for gratitude. Did you know today God is looking for gratitude? For those, whether you're online or in person, that he's looking at how we respond to his generosity and his salvation, to the prayers that he's answered, to the doors that he's opened, to the peace that he's brought. He's looking for the heart to turn around just like this man and say, God, I want to thank you for your goodness. God, you are worthy of my praise and my worship because no one else would do this. You are faithful when everybody else is unfaithful. You saw something in me when everybody else was blind to it. Verse 18 the man responded, no one has returned to give glory to God except this foreigner. And Jesus said to the man, stand up and go. He says, your faith, son, has healed you. The others received a miracle. But this one grateful dude received insight into his miracle. Now, the key, the difference is key because the rest of these guys just got a one-time fix. It's like the person who gets saved in church but then never darkens the door of the church anymore. They, they, yeah, they may have been, had some sins washed away, but they, they were they truly made new. But this man received an understanding that next time he faced something in life, because we all face things in life, it's not like you're going to have one trouble in life. You're going to have multiple, but he, Jesus equipped him and said, next time you run into something like this, I want you to remember that your faith made you whole, so next time there's trouble again, guess what your faith will do again if you reach out and believe? Gratitude, though, requires intimacy. The only way this man could express his, his gratitude towards Jesus was being intimate and getting close once again. Worship takes you close in. Giving gratitude by serving his people brings you close. Giving brings you close. Jesus says where your treasure is, your heart is. He says that gratitude um, brings you close. Mary's generosity decided to help Jesus accomplish his mission. 
Our generosity does the same. It exalts his name and it builds his kingdom. Just like Mary can partner with the spirit of gratitude, God calls us to partner with the spirit of gratitude. And that's the second thing I think if we sit down with Mary, she should tell us. Is gratitude comes from a free heart. And I just want to say this about worship. You know, you can be a burly man. You can swim with sharks, fight pit bulls, eat glass for lunch, like have more hair on your back than you do on your chest. But when the worship gets going, you can have a broken heart and an intimate heart towards God and sing your heart out and raise your hands. It is a lie our culture tells us that men are not able to do that. I I tend to look at my worship like this. If I was actually standing in the throne room, which one day I will be, how would I respond to his presence there? Would I just kind of blankly stare Or would I worship him? And I want to encourage you, when you step into an environment of worship, it's not about the band, it's not about the lights, it's not about a screen, it's not about any of this stuff we can buy. It's simply about a person's heart showing gratitude towards a God that loved them and saved them. And I want to encourage you that that's where gratitude starts, is in this place of worship. Now, I'm not telling you how you have to worship, but all I'm saying is when the band starts and worship is on, Do what you do to worship God with everything that you have. Because it's really true. You never know when your last opportunity to worship God here on this earth is. Because the next time you may be standing before him. We also know this, that, that, you know, gratitude is simply not only uh, leading yourself to Christ, but it's leading your family. And I'm going to step on some toes. I hope you wore some steel toes today. But I'm kind of tired of what culture tells us a parent is nowadays, that we're poll takers of our children that we're not leaders, that we actually go to junior and ask for junior's wisdom. But you've lived longer. You've seen more. You know more than them. And why do we let our kids lead us about the things of God? Thank God that God did not listen to our leadership when he sent his son, because scripture says while we yet hated him, he sent his son to die for us. If it was up to us and our spiritual leadership of ourselves, we would put ourselves straight in hell. And in our culture nowadays, it's almost like the p- parents are afraid to parent their kids. Like, but, but Scripture tells us this. It says, train up a child in the way he should go, that when he is old, he will not depart from it. Jesus showed, the Word of God gives us a window. It says, there is a window in time when they are a child that you train them, that you don't give them uh, opportunity. Hudson just finished a performance course at a school, and his coach didn't say, hey, if you just go do what you want with the weights. He said, this is how you do it. Because this is going to make you stronger. And I would challenge you, parents, don't take polls from your children. Train them in the ways of God. Because one day when they're an adult and they have their grandchildren and they don't go to the house of God, it's going to be too late to train them. Because they'll have their ways set. Take these days of training and, and sometimes they'll cry about it. Sometimes they'll be mad about it. But guess what? You're doing what God has called you to do. Forget what culture tells us. Look at what God tells us to do with training our children in the ways of God. Amen. I don't know, I'll clap to that one too. When you worship with him in a service, when you serve his people, you're free from that self-agenda. And there's no greater feeling in your life to just serve him for the sake of others. That's what Mary did. When we give and, and worship God with our gratitude, it's an expression of our heart, not of money. We got it backed up, reversed in our nation, in our, in, our, in our thinking that we think giving is about money. No, Scripture teaches us it's giving is actually about our heart. Now, what's unfortunate among the Christian culture and in church is that men have perverted this truth. We've added gimmicks and manipulation to it, and we, we told people, hey, if you give 10, you'll get 1,000 back, even though Scripture never promised that. Because generosity is not a gimmick. It's not some a scheme generosity and, and, and worshiping God with our resources is simply a heart that says, God, I thank you for the skills that you gave me and the breath in my lungs and the heart that beats in my chest that allows me to do what I do. And God, I just worship you with a portion of it and say thank you and hope, use this to help further your kingdom. That's what Mary did. She says, listen, Jesus, you made such a big difference in my life. I want to support you and your disciples so that message can continue. When we talk about worship, we talk about gratitude. We talk about simply turning around to the one who made us whole and living the rest of our life thanking him for it. The next thing that we know about Mary is that she was at the cross. Everyone else ran. But Mary and a handful of women, John 19, 25. It says, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother and and her sister, so family members. Mary, the wife of whatever his name is, and Mary Magdalene. Four people, 
Two of them were related to Jesus. I don't know if Mary and her sister were there simply because they believed in Jesus or more so Mary was watching her son die on a sinner's cross. What mom wouldn't be there? I mean, you loved them when they came out and they looked like raisins with eyes. Like, why wouldn't you be there in that moment? I understand them being there and I understand Mary's, the mother of Jesus' sister being there. Why was Mary Magdalene there when all the other men and people ran? I often wondered what she was thinking as she watched Jesus bleed, tortured on that cross. That warm soul, most likely as they walked along the road city to city that Mary shared conversations with. The man who set her free, who selflessly did so many miracles, she saw him when he was worn out from ministry and would turn around and heal people while he himself wanted to go retreat and rest. What did she think when she saw the man who taught truth, who didn't reek of religion or the politics of church? He was a light. Jesus lifted every heart and, and that he came in contact with. His, his teachings were so simple, yet so profound. But here he was, the one that everyone thought was the Messiah, with all this promise hanging on that cross powerless. See, Mary was faithful in the good times. She was there when Jesus was led into the Jerusalem and there was a parade and everybody shouted Hosanna. She was there when, when he fed the thousands. She was there on all the good days but, and faithful on the good days, but she was also faithful on the bad days. That's the heart that I think God wants for all, all of us. It's easy to be faithful in the good days, but are we faithful on the bad days when people are mocking, when people are putting down our faith and what we believe, when it's not easy? When you're nervous to tell people, yeah, I'm a Christian, what do we like on those days? When the one that you love, they say, is fake and is a liar and is not real, what do we like on those days? Well, Mary made a decision. On those days, I'm going to stand at the foot of this cross. He no longer looked like the Son of God. He looked like a common criminal, a liar, a cheater, a murderer hanging on a cross because that's who hung on crosses by Rome. I often wondered as she watched Jesus hanging there, did she struggle with doubts? I mean, I know I would. If I saw this person who for three years I followed, who had such promise and spoke such eloquently, and obviously God was with him, it seemed like everything he said was falling apart. It seemed like the picture that he painted about the future no longer existed. And sure, she loved him. And sure, she was grateful to him. And sure, she served him. Lots of people did that. What did she do? Did she have doubts? Did she have a moment where, where she's thinking, you know, Jesus, you said all these things, but you're dying, and, and dead people can't change the world? I mean, I think for all of us that we had doubts like that in our life. I'm not saying you don't love God. I'm not saying you don't believe in God. But have you doubted God in the process of the way that you live? That you look at what he says, and then you look at what you experience, and the gap in the middle is where your doubts live. And I would say that's where your doubts are born, is between what you experience and what he promises and what we choose to fill in that gap with. But fortunately, Mary knew how to be faithful in that moment. See, doubts can have several faces. For the atheist who just says, I don't believe in God at all, I don't think he exists, pure doubt. Many times as believers, we live, we say we believe in God, but we live as atheists. A Christian atheist says this, I believe in God, but I'm going to live my life like he's not real. I'll never allow myself to surrender in such a way that my destiny and my dreams truly rest in his hand. I'll always maintain enough control that it's still mine. But you never really know and have faith until that moment that you go all in. When you're willing to risk your own reputation and your own life, to stand at the foot of the cross and watch a bloody Messiah who's dying for you and simply say, I'm with him and I support him. I don't know how this will end. All I know is who he is, and I'm going to stand here even if I die with him. I don't think we truly know our faith until we have an all-in moment, all in with our time and our money and our power, all in with, with serving his kingdom until everything is just pushed in and say, I am with him, though I may not understand him. Though I may be confused by what's going on, I will stand at this cross because he deserves me to stand at this cross. He's earned the right that I stand at this cross during my doubts. 
I'm sure Mary had many doubts. I'm sure Mary had moments where she was standing there. In fact, we know she has doubts because three days later, Scripture tells us that Mary was one of the uh, three women that went to the grave to see Jesus. If she didn't have doubts and she thought he would be risen from the dead, why would she be there to prepare him for death? No, she thought it was over. She just closed that chapter and said, well, it was beautiful while it lasted. But obviously, I, I either misunderstood what he was saying or, or he just wasn't able to actually do what he said he could do. So I'm just going to close this chapter. I'm going to go decorate this for death. I'm going to bury it. I'm going to put it away. I'm going to say goodbye to it and just be done with it. But what allowed Mary to stay in a position to see the next part of this story was she was faithful on the bad days. And church, if there's anything that I want you to learn from Mary today is how to be faithful in the days that are horrible. How to be faithful in the days where the doubts are louder than your belief. On the days when everything seems shut, but you thought there was going to be an open door in front of you. If we can learn how to be faithful in the bad days, we get to see the resurrection days in our life. Where we understand our understanding of God. When our understanding of who God is doesn't match our experience, what Mary decided to do that day, she decided, I will be faithful when what I understand about him and what I'm experiencing are two different things. On the days our dreams die, on the days the promises seem to go silent, Mary decided to be faithful. In fact, I'll be honest with you. I don't truly understand God's ways, all of his ways. I've tried. I've given him the benefit of the doubt. I've, I've studied the scriptures year after year. I've listened to messages. I've, I've done everything I did just to understand God's ways. And I thought, maybe if I can understand him, I'll see what's coming around corners better in my life. But scripture tells us we will never truly understand all of God's ways. And if you're waiting to understand his ways to help prop up your faith, then your faith is always going to be weak because Scripture asks us to have even greater faith of just understanding His ways. We just trust Him in the gap of what we don't understand. Isaiah put it this way, for as the sky soars above the earth, in other words, look to infinity of the sky, so the way I work surpasses the way you work. And the way I think is beyond the way that you think. So the idea that you can reach up and understand my ways in your short little life, he says it's impossible. So I just need you to do something. I need you to allow your faithfulness to stand before me in those moments so that I can get you to the other side. So my question for us today is when we have our doubts, when our Jesus is hanging on the cross, do we run, do we quit, do we get mad, do we give up, or do we lean on ourselves? I think Mary would tell us this, my third point, be faithful even when you have doubts. Even when you have doubts, be faithful. There's another story in Scripture, and I read it every year. It's the story of Job, and Scripture tells us there was a wrestling match basically in heaven, a conversation, and Job got caught in the middle of this spiritual battle. And the story of Job is is that he lost everything. He lost his children. He lost his wife. He lost his possessions. And finally, he he began to lose his health where boils were out on his skin. And his three friends come along and criticize him and blame him. And Job is basically alone in this moment because he says, "I, I don't know if I deserve this. I don't know why it's happening to me. But Job says something that has always just settled in my spirit. He says this, Job 13, 15. He says, because even if he killed me, I keep on hoping. And for Job, that was a near reality for him. Because the way things were going in his life, y'all think y'all have had some bad turns? Job's was just one giant, you turn into bad. And he says, listen, even if he kills me, with my last breath, he says, I will keep hoping because I know the nature of my God is different than what I'm experiencing. And hope is the only bridge to get me to what he's promised. See, regardless of our doubts, church, God's called us to be faithful. In heaven, faithfulness is what opens the door to the next level. It's what knocks on the door that gets you to the other side. If we're faithful when we have doubts, Scripture says God rewards it. Listen to James 1.12. He says, happy are those who remain faithful under trials and tests and difficulty. 
Because when they succeed in passing such a test, in other words, it will not last forever, they will receive as their reward the life which God has promised to those who love him. If they know how to be faithful in the difficult days, not just the good days, he says there's a reward for them and they'll experience everything that God has for them. The last lesson that I want to, that comes from her scripture is this. We know that she had doubts because she, she stood at the grave after Jesus was buried and he's thrown into a, somebody else's tomb and, and not even properly prepared. In our day and age, it'd be an embalming. They didn't even do that. They just threw him in there because of Passover. Three days later, she comes back with all the spices, all the things necessary out of Jewish tradition to prepare his body uh, to, for rest. And this is it in Matthew 28. So she came with her doubts. But she was faithful, and that's why she ended up at the tomb. After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel Lord came down from heaven, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone, and sat on it. Now, I love that the angel just sat on the stone. He didn't have to sit on the stone. He just rolled it out of the way and then popped up on top of it like, yeah, what you going to do, right? I love that. That's how I see it. Because I know his legs don't get tired because he's like a heavenly being. He glows and has a sword and wings and stuff and has a little bing. You know, like I know he's not tired. He just said, I'm just like, boom, I rolled back the stone. <laughs> his appearance was like lightning and his clothes were as white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him, they shook and became like dead men. Now, these were Roman centurions. They had breathe and eat battle for their life. They were the most, and I guarantee they put the best on there. They didn't put like Johnny who got distracted on his phone. They put the best on there, right? And these men, when they saw the angel, just like, Ooh, and fell over. Then Mary and Mary come up. And the angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, for that I know that you're looking for Jesus because he was crucified. This is typically where you find dead people. It's typically where you lose them is in this tomb. He says, he's not here anymore. He has risen. How? Why do we know that? Just as he said. He said, Mary, if you actually remember something that he told you, he said he would die and rise from the dead. Come and see the place where he lay. In other words, let me show you where he was. But he said he wouldn't be here anymore. Mary, why are you looking in a tomb that's empty if he already told you he wouldn't be here? So Mary, let me move you past your doubts and let me move you towards Jesus once again. And God always is there dragging us past our doubts, not condemning us for us, but just say, let me move you to something new. Because here's the truth. Our doubts prepare us for the wrong future. The reason she ended up at that grave is because her doubts led her there, not her listening to what God said. And anytime we allow our doubts to lead our life, it prepares us for a future that is not ours. And that day, Mary ended up at a tomb, but Jesus was no longer at the tomb. She couldn't find her destiny. She couldn't find her purpose. She couldn't find the promises there at the tomb because they weren't there. Because that's where doubt leads us. It always leads us to a different future than what our trust in God provides. The future where God is dead or God is impotent. Maybe it was just a fable. Maybe it was just a hint. Maybe it was just a good Sunday, but you forgot it all. That's not the future God has for us. This is the fourth thing I think Mary would tell us if we sat down with coffee with her. What we see can cause us to forget what we heard. What we see often causes us to forget what we've heard. Sometimes we hear these promises of God and you come out of a Sunday morning ready just to kick the devil in the teeth and have an amazing week. And then Monday your boss calls and things go down and all of a sudden you go from mountain high to valley low. And you forget and doubt creeps in. What we begin to do in those moments is we stay faithful because if we keep staying faithful, it's going to lead us to that moment, that intersection where God leads us back towards his promises. And sometimes we forget what we've heard because of what we see. And if you live long enough, you're going to see plenty of things that feed your doubts. You're going to experience things that rattle your faith. But if we learn from Mary, if I just stay faithful, even if I forget what I've heard, at least if my faithfulness will get me to a place where I can have that intersection with God's power again and get on the road that he has for me. Maybe you're Mary today. 
You're going to visit the tomb. He said, man, it's over, Eddie. My wife divorced me. This is the way it is. And my career's this. But I want to encourage you, stay faithful. And then start reminding yourself of what you've heard and stop remind, looking at what you see, but remind yourself of what you've heard. Because God's word is what resurrected Jesus. It is impossible for God's promises to fail in our life. We just have to wait long enough to allow God to do his time and his work and his ways because they're above ours. We're not going to understand them. So the idea that you give up on God because you don't understand him is, is really a dumb idea. Because he already told you up front, you're not going to understand me. I'm just a little bit smarter than you. I created you. I call you child. I'm father. So the idea that you're going to understand what dad's doing all the time, it's not. But what you have to do with dad is trust me as I walk you through this process because I won't let you fall. I won't let you fail. You may not always understand my ways, but trust me. If there's a grave there, there's also a resurrection there. And there's a messenger to that resurrection. Jesus said this, for the word of God will never fail. And for those of us today standing at the foot of our cross, looking at our doubts, I want to remind you that God's word will never fail you. It may be a different path. It may be a different journey. It may have a different twist than you, what you thought it would be. But God will never, ever fail you. If he fell, if his word failed, then this world would fail. Because this world is held together by his words. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I pray for all of us in this room today. And I pray that we learn the lessons of Mary. That, Father, our doubts never prepare us for the future that you have for us. I pray for those this morning who are feel under the weight of just a spirit of fear. That fear has pushed its way into their home and in their thinking and into their every part of who they are. And I break the power of that spirit of fear in the name of Jesus. And I say, fear, you have no place in our life. Our life belongs to Jesus Christ, and you have no right. You have no ownership to be there. And I, we just command fear to go in peace and joy and rest to take its place. But God, I pray for those today that are at their cross, at their moment in their life where they don't understand what's happening and it seems like it's all falling apart and all the promises, all the sunny days, all the good days are gone and the stormy days are here and they don't see how they're going to make it through the other side. I pray for them, Father, that they stay faithful because there's a resurrection in their future. There's a moment that they can't see because they're blinded by the doubt and the fear that they're going through. God, as you were faithful to Mary Magdalene, a woman who simply loved you and served your kingdom, God, you'll be faithful because we love you and we want to serve you too. But Father, in fact, you love us so much, you loved us before we ever did. So Father, I just thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit today to set people free, to make us new. In Jesus' name. With every head bowed, every eye closed. I want to give you the opportunity today that if you don't know Jesus, and when I say that, not know about Jesus, not, you know, a lot of people know historically that Jesus existed, but I'm like, there's not an intimate relationship. And when we talk about salvation, we talk about, it's not about going to church, it's about an intimate relationship with God. And if you don't have an intimate relationship with God, then today I want to be the one, if you'll let me, I'd like to lead you in a prayer to begin that relationship today. This is not the end of the road, this is the beginning of it. And if that's you today, and you say, today, Eddie, I want to become a Christian for the very first time, become a follower of Christ, and have a relationship with God, or I want to renew my relationship with God, whether you're in, in person here today or online today, regardless of where you're at today, if that's you, I want you to lift your hand real quick, and I want to see who you are. You say, if you're here today, and you say, I want to begin my relationship with God, thank you. Let me see your hand. Amen. If you're online today, the, the, one of the systems is you can press a button that, that says I'm raising my hand and just lets us know you made that decision. But I want to pray a prayer with everybody, whether here or online, this morning. And say this simple prayer after me. Say, Heavenly Father, I ask that you would forgive me of my sins. I ask you to be the Lord of my life. And I choose to follow you with all of my heart. 
this day forward. Thank you for loving me. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's give God praise for those that made that decision today. So awesome. I'm so blessed to be a part of that decision. That is the one thing in our life that is transformational. From this day forward, you have a connection with God. Uh, next thing I want to do is just receive our tithe and offering. And this is an act of worship. All we simply do as a church is ask that you talk to Jesus. And talk to your Heavenly Father and say, what should I give today? And I guarantee He will lead you to a place of giving. We never want to manipulate you. We never want to show up pictures of a, you know, a sad church person and be like, give to this. Like, we're not going to do that. Uh, we just simply want you to worship God. And we use the word generosity, but really the word Scripture uses and the term Scripture uses is worship. It just comes out of a generous heart that we give a portion of what God's blessed us with. And, and I'd encourage you, if you've never been a giver given like this before, just pick a spot to start. And then from there, allow God to grow that in your life. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you tell us to honor you, Proverbs 3, 9, honor you with our wealth. And Father, we want to honor you with the best part of everything we produce. We have a heart that simply says, God, we want to honor you. And I thank you for this opportunity to give today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're going to give today, you can give online. You can give via text messages. If you're at home, we can mail message, uh, mail envelopes to you if you want. We're not going to pass buckets because buckets are apparently deadly right now. So when they're not, when they're off the lethal list and we can pass buckets again, we'll do it. Maybe we'll just, y'all can practice basketball and just make it like wad it up and shoot it into a basket. That would actually be fun, you know. Um, we have basket, a uh, little container thing on the back of the sound booth in that hall so you can give there. Um, anyway, you got to laugh, right? I mean, what else are you going to do during all these days? Actually, I posted a little picture in one of my Instagram stories. There's a guy wearing a, his underwear as a mask, and I was just like, oh, things are bad. Like, that's, if, if you saw me wearing my underwear, things are bad, right? Like, because I know what happens in underwear, and I don't want that on my face. So, anyway, Lord help us. Let's all stand. I want to serve you guys communion and get you out of here. <laughs> Isaiah 53 tells us that it was our weakness that he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. We thought his troubles were punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. Jesus did all that for us. Why do we leave so much of that on the table? Why do we walk around with broken hearts, filled with sorrows, filled with rejection? Why do we say, thank you, Jesus, you've done all this, but we leave it on the table? What if today when we receive communion, not only are we remembering what Christ has done, but some of us pick up joy again, pick up peace again, pick up freedom again? Because if he paid for it, church, why in the world do we not access it? He was pierced for our rebellion because our rebellion pushed us away. He did that so we could be close. If he was crushed for our sins, if he was beaten so we could be whole, why are we still broken? Because if he is whipped so we could be healed, why don't we cry out for healing? Communion should remind us of what he did and what we have. That's why he wants us to do it. When Paul was serving the early church communion, he used the words Jesus did at the last meal. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four. he says, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Heavenly Father, today we thank you that our healing was purchased on the cross. Our peace of mind was purchased on the cross. Our heart and mind are made whole. Depression and fear has no power over us. Worry has no power over us. Our minds are being renewed. Our body is being healed. Every cell of our body has to line up with your word.
because Jesus paid that price. Father, I pray for all of us in this room today and all of us listening online, God, that we would live fully in what you've given us. Father, we would not live in only 10% of it, but God, let us explore every corner of our salvation. In Jesus' name. The second thing Paul shared with the early church is what Jesus said next. He says, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. He says, I want for them it was wine. Well, for us, it's grape juice in the tiniest cup made by man. He says, when you see this, I want you to remember that my blood flowed because that blood bought you something. That blood made a promise to you. And as long as I'm alive, as long as God exists, I cannot break that promise to you. Father, we thank you today for the blood of Christ. He signed a covenant, a contract with us that we're forgiven if we confess our sins, that we're healed by your power, that we're made whole by your grace. I thank you that, Father, therefore sin no longer has power over us, that we're forgiven of all of our sins, past, present, and future. I thank you today that we've been made completely right with you because of what Jesus did. I thank you that you preserve us, that you provide for us, that you make us whole. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us when we hated you. When we didn't know to ask, Father, you provided the answer. So I pray this week, Father, as we step back into the real world, that, God, you sustain us with your spirit. Let your word be the, a guard around our heart, that, Father, we will not fail even when times get tough. And we thank you for that today. In Jesus' name. Well, we want to encourage everybody today. If you did make a decision, remember, please text decision to 972-460-9235. It's just a way for our team to celebrate the amazing decision that you've made today. And we want to give you some next steps as it comes to your new relationship with God. Uh, uh, last thing, just a quick reminder, like Pastor already said, we are kicking off this 21 days of prayer here in the month of August. And we do have a devotional that you can participate in. If you download our City Point Church app or already have it downloaded, there's a 21 days of prayer square that if you select, you see the Devo. Also, uh, we will be having uh, daily prayer meetings, I guess you could say, uh, both digitally through Zoom and as well as in person here at the church at 7 p.m. And so whether you feel comfortable coming in to, uh, to the auditorium or if you would like to join in on Zoom online, you can do that. Just like I said, go to the best way to do that is go through the app and select that there. Uh, I want to pray for you guys and then we'll have a great Sunday. So God, we just thank you, Lord, for an opportunity to come together and worship, whether it's online or in person. Uh, and, and Jesus, we just thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you uh, for your decision to choose us, to choose life. And so I just ask Holy Spirit that you're with each and every one of us today. As we leave today, as we drive away, Holy Spirit, that you are working on this word in our hearts. Help us to just remember your heroes in the Bible. Uh, to help us to realize that they were just humans. That being led by you. And so we ask that you lead us, Holy Spirit, that when we're full of doubt, full of hurt, full of discouragement, that we be like Job and say, even if this kills me, that our hope is in you. So I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're filling us up, you're strengthening us this week. I thank you for all the families that are represented in this auditorium as well as online. We thank you that we're one body worshiping you. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all have a great rest of your Sunday, and we'll see you guys next week. Have a good one.